<laughs> is it possible? Is it possible that one life can change the whole world, even if only the people close to that person knew them? In our Catholic faith, we know that is an absolute yes. Our series Under the Mantle of Mary continues today, and I have the opportunity to bring you the very special story of Matthew Prevost. Of Matthew Prevost. By any measure, Matthew's life was too short, and yet the impact to those who knew him, and hopefully those listening now, is great. I am joined by his parents, Mary and Ron Prevost, and by Bishop Kenneth Steiner, who shares a part of Matthew's story. Good morning, Bishop. Good morning, Ron and Mary. Thank you so much for joining me. Good morning. Well, first, Mary and Ron, tell us about your family and the very special way that Matthew came to be part of it. Um, We had decided that we wanted to add to our family through adoption. We have two older children, uh, Robert and Bonnie, and we adopted Christina, and then we decided to add one more child. And because I had some medical background, we decided that we would take medical fragile children. And when we first found out about Matthew, we actually were told that we were asked if we would take a terminally ill child, which we prayed about and decided that we would say yes to. And uh, I was actually at the adoption state office looking through a book of children and found Matthew and had decided this is the one for us. And that whole morning, our adoption worker had been trying to get in touch with us to tell us about Matthew. So it was pretty coincidental. It was a God coincidence. (laughs) There was no picture of Matthew, right? There was no picture of Matthew, you said, in that book. Tell us, because his, his birth was quite traumatic, and uh, it, it uh, was a very unique adoption story. And his health, by virtue of his prematurity, is what led to the, the health issues that he had you know, throughout his whole life. Right. Right. He was um, born at between 22 and 24 weeks. Um, he weighed one pound, nine ounces. He was 12 inches long, smaller than a loaf of bread. Um, He was saved by wonderful nurses at Emmanuel Hospital, who we love to this day, um, that resuscitated him. They were actually called in for an infant death. And when they saw his eyes open, they resuscitated him and took care of him for four and a half months. He was then in a medical foster care home until he came to live with us. So uh, Ron and Mary, and then for our listeners, so they understand this, how old would Matthew be today? (laughs) Right. Born in 1985. 85. 35 this year. 35 years old. So for our listeners to recognize that a baby born at 22 and 24 weeks, even today, with all of the medical technology that we have, 35 years ago, I think that may have been, he very well may have been the earliest premature surviving child. I mean, it just really wasn't heard of back then. So Ron, when you made the decision to, to bring Matthew home, you had this little boy who needed so much. And, and it would seem that even then you would know that it would be his whole life that he would have these medical, uh, needs. Did you have kind of apprehension knowing that you wouldn't be a typical father to a typical son? I did. I had apprehensions. You know, I guess I feel like Joseph probably felt uh, (laughs) when when he was informed about God's plans for he and Mary. You know, I'm sure I felt like, really, Lord, is this really my skill set? Is that set for me? But we had said we would open our home and we were really willing to do that, and so we did. But yeah, there was there was hesitancy there. Yeah. I am speaking this morning with Mary and Ron Prevost. We are talking about the very unique and miraculous story of the life of their son, Matthew. I am also joined here by Bishop Kenneth Steiner. So right from the beginning, we know that Matthew's life would not be an ordinary one. And from the moment he came into your family, your family was changed forever. But it was one morning that Matthew came to you with a dream. And it really set in motion 
really the rest of your lives with him and and after. Tell us about that. Um, is this the, the dream that Matthew had his visits with Mary and Jesus? Absolutely. So um, Matthew was six years old. It was the summer before he died. And I want to back up just a little bit. About a year and a half before, he had a very good friend named Eric that passed away that he had met up at Dornbecker, Eric Latterby. And when Eric was dying, Matthew was so excited that he was getting to go to heaven and be with Jesus. And so that summer, every day Matthew would say, when am I going to get to go to heaven and be with Jesus, Mommy? And my standard mantra would be, when Jesus calls you, Matthew, that's when you will get to go to heaven. Absolutely. And so one morning in July of 1991, he woke up and he said, guess what? Guess who came to visit me last night, Mommy? And I said, well, who, Matthew? And he said, Mary, Jesus is Mommy. And she said that I'm going to get to go to heaven and she's going to take care of me until you and Daddy get there. And she's going to read stories to me and play games with me. And he described this beautiful place of heaven where he was going to be. And so um, these visits went on for about three weeks. And every morning he had a different story to tell. He, I've got the story in front of me to re remind me here of a few things. And one was he, he shared that uh, one of the visits that Mary was dressed all in white with a blue veil. And she told me there would be no pokes or owies in heaven. She told me I would be able to eat. And this was very important. He was going to be able to run with new legs. Um, and then one morning he woke up and this was the last morning of the visits. He woke up and he was very, very excited. And he said, guess who else came to visit me last night, mommy? He said, Jesus came to visit me. And he said that I'm going to go to heaven to be with him on September 18th, the exact day. And so he got a pen and he started every day crossing <laughs> the days off <laughs> in red ink until September 18th. And so I went to Bishop Steiner one day and I said, well, what are we going to do? Because I didn't doubt this. I said, what are we going to do if Matthew wakes up on September 18th? And Bishop Steiner said, we will have a big mass for him. And so on September 18th, Matthew woke up and he opened one eye and he said, I'm still here, aren't I, Mommy? <laughs> and he was so disappointed. And so I said, well, we're going to go to mass because God has bigger plans for you. He's not done with your life yet. So we went to mass and Bishop Steiner gave a beautiful homily about, um, about how much more Matthew had to do and give in his life. And then we, went, we let a bunch of balloons go and the biggest balloon went to heaven to be with his friend, Eric. But the very next day, his Sickman catheter, which he depended on for nutrition, um, was infected. And that was sort of the beginning of the, his journey to Jesus. All right. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Yes, Ron. Yeah, you can see already in, the, in, in that story how much faith he had in what God was providing and, and who Jesus was and who Mary was. Um, you know, he joined us. We were still in a faith journey. You know, we, we both grew up Presbyterian and were faithful to, to the Lord. But just didn't feel like we were quite home yet. And we were found our, you know, Matthew joined us and, and finished that journey. We found ourselves at the Catholic church at the doorstep of the Catholic church and, and Bishop Steiner and the church really welcomed us in. And just about uh, six months before the story Mary just told you, uh, Bishop recognized Matthew's devout faith, incredible faith for a child uh, and and welcomed him into the church and gave him baptism for well he'd already been baptized but gave him first communion and confirmation and then right about the same time we joined and the Eucharist and the Eucharist, and the Eucharist. yes That's at great. age five. <laughs> Oh, that what a blessing. And again, uh, I think it's just more proof that that right from the beginning, it was a journey that God had already planned out. And it was just a matter of every all of you just kind of getting on board with that. I am speaking this morning with Mary and Ron Prevost and Bishop Kenneth Steiner is joining us today. We're talking about their very special child, Matthew, and his life and now legacy. 
so Mary and Ron, I am a parent of four children. And while they are grown, I know that probably when they were younger, if any of them came to me and over time, they have had special dreams, but really maybe most parents would say, well, isn't that a nice dream? Did you <laughs> kind of think about this as that something very unique is happening? Or did you maybe put this in the category about, isn't it nice that Matthew is having such wonderful mm -hmm. dreams? I, I think for me, I'd had a similar experience in my life. And so I did not doubt Matthew for a moment. But I did talk to Bishop Steiner about it, and I keep a journal, and so I journaled it all. And so I, I, I trusted that Matthew was really having visits with Mary. Oh, I, it's it's so important to be able to have that knowledge too. Our children, I think, um, are less closed off to the miraculous than I think maybe their adult parents can be. Yeah, I've never had that that personal of an experience, but I have a very good friend who was passing away. And this happened to him. And I had no reason to doubt him. He was a really solid guy. And so I carried that with me for many, many years. Wow. And then when Matthew said this, I said, you know, I don't think I can doubt this. <laughs> Oh, and it's wonderful. Bishop Steiner, I want to talk with you a little bit about this now, too, because Matthew has played a really integral part of your own ministry and life as a priest and, and well, life as a bishop. Tell us a little bit about when you first met Ron and Mary and young Matthew. Okay, there were a couple other little items of their story that I think maybe are real important. First of all, Matthew was never able to eat or drink in his life. And yet he received communion, miracle of miracles. And um, so that's an important part. But also that Matthew came into the church before Ron and Mary did. He did. You know, because of them that they came into the church. Is that right? A little and, child uh, a shall, little lead, child shall, shall lead, lead them. them. Well, that's right. And... Um, so I was there to, as they say, confirm him and uh, give him the Eucharist for the first time and the anointing of the sick, of course, which he probably didn't really need because he was, you know, he was beyond that. He was already. But um, anyway, that journey that uh, of the last year or so of his life, that it was amazing. I was, you know, very involved in that is they'll tell you all the time and Mary asking me all these questions about what do I tell Matthew when he says, uh, when Jesus and Mary appear to me, what should I say? <laughs> and uh, then the other thing was, uh, well, they said about the date that he was going to go to go to heaven. And uh, so we did have that special ceremony of, uh, of new life and setting forth those balloons and so forth. But um, it, Anyway, I forgot. So, so there's a little bit more to the story about his inability to walk, to talk almost, and he just grew so. But for a little child like that to grow, not only I mean, he didn't grow physically very much, but he developed spiritually. He just uh, he did everything, and I have a whole album, and Mary can tell you about that, where he wrote me letters and to sign things you know you can hardly make out that it was Matthew but and he was always she was on the typewriter and Matthew was saying what uh, he wanted his mother to uh, say to me and everything but uh, anyway I, I really felt honored that I was a part of this little boy's journey at the end of his life and here Ron and Mary have been with him a lot longer and how much that means to them and in, in all of this, it's not just uh, Matthew and everything, but he touched so many people in his lifetime, mm -hmm. and like Ron mentioned yeah. Glenn and so forth. But I know other people that remember there were a couple people with AIDS at that time. One man came into the came back to the church the day that Matthew died because he wanted to go to church on the feast of the Immaculate Conception, and that was the day. Uh, Matthew died. And that was another real important part of the story from my point of view is 
being with Matthew, his Hickman catheter through which he was fed almost directly into the heart the last, whatever it was, three or four years of his life. But um, that came out on my birthday, November 25th. And Mary has all of this journaled her interviews of Matthew. There are three interviews on that tape. and One is on the 26th, the day after his Hickman catheter came out. And he said, I want to go to heaven to be with and she said, who are you going to see? Jesus and Mary. And uh, he, he mentioned me several times, and Deacon Don and Father John, you know. So he, his spiritual life, he, he was always thinking of others. You know, he wasn't thinking about himself. And as they'll tell you, and I can show with these pictures, I never knew Matthew not to be smiling. And his, he had a perpetual smile. Yeah faith despite going through nearly 30 surgeries and all the other hospitalizations and so forth for him um so so anyway there are a lot of i, I really wanted them to tell the story of him but uh of course i'm <laughs> but we all have a part to play right. and as you know, short his life was again the impact mm -hmm. to everybody it sounds like um was just so great mary shared a little bit of the journal that she had mm -hmm. written about the life bishop and in it she says that you and matthew had conversations well beyond the years of a young child yeah. share with us a little bit about that interaction if you would just so that way we get a little bit more of an insight of this this really miraculous young boy uh you think that i remember back that was 29 years ago <laughs> <laughs> it feels like you remember quite a bit well, i do did, did he ever ask you about what you know, heaven was like, or did you ever oh, yeah. doubt that he, that, that it, oh, yeah. it was visits from Mary that he was uh -huh. receiving? No, it would be saying, you know, he'd talk about, I wonder what heaven's going to be like, or what did God look like, or Jesus look like, uh, things like that. And, but it just seemed like his whole life was centered on the spiritual, the, the, uh, the future rather than his present suffering and so forth. So, uh, again, I don't remember, but it would be like a little child, you know. I mean, here he was only six years old, and what did he know about all this? But uh, so he was like, you know, many people kind of uh, with their own questions about God, who is God is, heaven, what's it like, and so forth. So again, I don't remember specifics, but if I go back, I can see all the things that he wrote through his mother Mary asking me <laughs> what to do, and he was always praying for me. And uh, maybe tell them about the that, uh, the treasures that he had. Oh, because what, oh what actually, do you give, I have the, tre you, the treasure okay. box. But what do you give a little child, you know, if it's his birthday or something, what do you give him when uh, he can't eat? Uh, everything kind of centers around that so what do you give a little child so i gave him what a picture of saint Teresa or something and then medals and pretty soon a picture of myself and the pope and <laughs> yeah. there it is there it is that's what i gave that's right and uh and here's him, the other one oh <laughs> and tell him about the doctor in the hospital um Mary Ann Gunther's daughter, who was a doctor, and she put the mask over Matthew. Oh, I had forgotten about that. Yeah, oh, that one. That is really something because the only time yeah. Mary said the only time he ever cried is when he they put this mask on his face to give him ether. Ether, and she and, didn't do it. She no. found a way to get around it so that he didn't have to be traumatized. That's right. I had forgotten yeah. about that. I think Bishop's have, talking about the the Matthew wanted a treasure chest to take things to heaven with him, and ah. so those pictures he's we've got this whole little treasure, little chest, treasure chest here of all the things that he was going to take to heaven with him. Uh, of course, we've treasured that and kept it on our front desk. <laughs> and remember that doctor saw his, the picture of being the Pope, you know, yes. on the garden, and she said, "Oh." Do you know Bishop Steiner? Yes. Pope right. Steiner. And how he wanted to be the Pope. He did. When he couldn't be Mother Teresa, he decided <laughs> to be the Pope. 
<laughs> that was for Vocation Sundays, and that's when he met Father John Kearns. That's and, right. And he actually, in his treasure chest for heaven, kept Father John, <laughs> I'm looking for it, Father John Kearns' business, business card. Business card. <laughs> and we've had this for oh. many, many years, and he taped it to his bed. And every time we went to Dornbecker, he'd take it with us and say, we got to call Father John Kearns. <laughs> and so, Very good. So Father John Kearns was the, was the vocation director that year, and Matthew dressed up oh. as the Pope. But he also wanted to marry a little six-year-old named Leanne Goolsby, <laughs> who is now married with four children, and she named one of her children after Matthew. So, and um, then wasn't there a little girl that was in the first grade with him that later on became? Oh, a she she did. We were up at the cemetery, and Leanne came up behind us and said, "I want to be Catholic. Will you be our godparents?" So here, Leanne who was going to be Matthew's wife someday if he didn't become a pope. <laughs> um, we became her godparents, and um, and she came into the church. And her actually, her whole family came into the church that year. So another Matthew, Matthew miracle, and she's kept in touch with us all these years. Oh, that's right. And as I said in our open, yeah, the, the impact that one life can make, even one cut so short, will go on and the legacy of Matthew's life will go on in all of the people who uh, he's met and those that have converted since then. I want to move now towards those last days because we talked and touched a little bit about how that happened. Uh, just share with us a little bit of the story, if you will, about Matthew's attitude as he knew that his, his own time on earth was coming to an end. He was, he was very comfortable. He was very comfortable with with that, <laughs> you know, and, uh, more comfortable than I was, right? Yeah. And so, about a couple of weeks before he did pass away, you know, I'm just agonizing over letting letting go of this this boy, and it, it might be his time. He came into my office, and I wanted to talk, so I put him on my knee, and we were looking out the window together, and the conversation finally just said, "Nope." I'm ready. I want to go see Jesus. And it was sort of like a blessing to me, sort of like, yeah, I'm letting you off of the hook, Dad. You don't have to worry about it. It's it's going to be okay. And he he knew he, he, Jesus was coming. And he was just a little concerned that Jesus would know exactly where he was. <laughs> so, this is precious. And so he said, Dad, oh. I want to put a sign in the window. <laughs> I forgot that. So he described the design, and I cut out a pretty good star here, really, with uh, out of construction paper. And on one side, we hung this in the window. And on one side, it says, Matthew is here. And on the other side, it says, Jesus, come and take me home. And he actually instructed Ron with the exact words to write and the kind of star it was going to be. And when we moved him from his bedroom to the family room, he made sure that the star was in the next window. And so. tell him about the roses. The roses. The roses. So when Matt was four years old, he wanted a statue of Mary and, um, and a rose bush outside his bedroom window. And so he and I went and we found it and at this nursery and we Ron planted it and it was outside his window and then the last two weeks of his life Bishop we were new Catholics we've been Catholic for a little over a year and Bishop Steiner brought me a holy card of St. Therese and said start praying to St. Therese for a happy holy death for Matthew so I started praying this prayer I didn't know anything about St. Therese I didn't know about her shower of roses but about a week before he died his rose bush on De in December, and it was cold, started blooming. And um, Bishop Steiner came over and he said, you have a miracle. And, and then he explained to us about St. Therese and the roses. And then when we moved Matthew from his bedroom to the family room, there were rose bushes outside that window and those roses started blooming. So I have, I have one picture of a whole lot of roses. <laughs> And that was when we were praying a novena for my friend Neoma Sparks when she was dying. And we got 78 roses that year. 
But for a long time, Matthew's rose bush would bloom on the day he died and often on his birthday on February 2nd. Roses yeah. in the middle. It's yeah. winter. It's correct? winter. Correct. I call these, I call this set of roses my Holy Spirit roses. These bloomed on uh, the day that Father Santiago Fu of the St. John Society was ordained. So I'm saving these. Next time he's in America, he gets them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bishop Steiner has his roses as well. Oh, but that is. Again, truly miraculous, I think, right from the beginning of his life, uh, even uh, to his death, that, that the miracles in the hand of God are always so close to him. What, one other little thing. Yes. Uh, Matthew was born on February the 2nd, the feast of the presentation of Jesus in the temple and the purification of Mary. And he died as we celebrated the feast of the Immaculate Conception. And uh, I was, that picture I have of him, uh, sitting on the couch with him, I told him, Matthew, Saturday is Mary's feast day, the Immaculate Conception. And he turns to Mary, his mother, and says, I didn't have any idea that he didn't know what day was which. He said, how many days until Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> so he waited and died on Saturday morning. On Saturday. Oh, yeah. Well, God rest his soul. Right. Bishop Steiner, I can tell you've had such a close relationship with the family from the time that you met mm -hmm. all of them and, and got to share some time with Matthew. In the years since that day, since the day he left to his heavenly home, what impact has Matthew's life and his legacy been on all of your ministry since that time? Well, first of all, I pray to him every day because I know he's in heaven. His mother asked me shortly after he died, what does it take to canonize a little child like that? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, we don't do that. Even bishops can't do that. But we know he's in heaven. He's only six years old. We're, mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, so he's canonized by popular uh, assent. And, <laughs> But anyway, so I've remembered him even when I go on the golf course. I pray to Matthew sometimes to get the right shots. And he, <laughs> instead of rosaries, roses, sending down roses on earth, he sends me little good golf shots. <laughs> so, yes. so, and, uh, well, there's, there's more to it about the golf today. <laughs> about the, the gifts that Matthew got for my birthday which was the day before his Hickman catheter came out of the day. And he got me some golf balls that would go very far and brought him over. I don't know if it was Mary or Ron that brought him over to uh, bring me those birthday gifts. I have two different versions of that so and pictures. But um, anyway, um, so he's really influenced my life, you know, that I remember those days so clearly in everything and it's because of uh, Matthew and the other thing I don't know if we mentioned enough but he was like I happen to have right here uh, his piggy bank or <laughs> the savings of his piggy bank and these are all nickels and dimes and pennies and they're all dated before 1992 so these are the actual coin <laughs> Put in his piggy bag, and uh, but I replaced him with other things. But on uh, this little box, it says, "Please use this money to buy sleeping bags for the homeless." The loose change is from Matthew's piggy bank. He prayed every night, "Please help the poor people who do not have a home or a warm place to sleep." And this is from Ron and Mary, but. Uh, and in her, she interviewed her son, you know, for a couple months before he died. And it's amazing what he says on that tape, you know. Uh, and again, everything, he's not thinking about himself or feeling sorry for himself or whimpering. Uh, he's thinking about other people. And he mentions the other people he's praying for and everything. So he was just totally, um, really a a saint and uh anyway oh i love that and, and i've got to say how uh 
quite unique. Again, as I said, with four children, I've taken my children to the store before when we've had to pick out a birthday present for one of their friends. And they were notorious even, you know, from a young age that they want to pick out things that they want. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> to know enough and to care enough. <laughs> Others mm -hmm. to know that Bishop Steiner, you needed the uh, golf balls that would go the farthest. I think it was just mm -hmm. absolutely perfect. Well, as we kind of start to finish up, I, I don't want to go without asking you about your lives in, in the in the days, months, and then really years since that time. For those who perhaps you didn't know that Matthew's life had an impact on them, and even in your own life, how has those brief years? of this, again, miraculous child. How did that really kind of change the trajectory of your life and how has it focused your faith since then? Um, you know, it was really hard to lose a child. I, I thought I was ready mm -hmm. because Matthew was so ready to go to heaven. And I think the hardest part was just missing him afterwards. And it, and it did change the family dynamics. Um, that I want to mention because our kids, our other three kids are really heroes. You know, we're talking about Matthew, but Robert and Bonnie and Christina, they all helped him with his therapy every day and they were there for him. And when mommy had to go out of town, it was daddy and plan B and the friends and the neighbors at church that helped take care of the family core. And so there were definitely, you know, some challenges. Um, but I think for me, Matthew, I am not afraid to die. I am really looking forward to seeing Jesus. And I think Matthew, even though I had those feelings before, I think being with him, I mean, when he died, all of us in the room were Catholic. The nurse, his pediatrician, uh, Bishop Steiner, um, our kids were there. Um, it just strengthened me that I am looking forward to that day that... Um, I'm going to see Jesus and his mother and my son and my family. And I also think it, it gave me a new insight on helping other people and other families who have lost children. Um, that there's, they're sometimes forgotten. And so I think it gave me a new ministry and being able to help other families that have lost children. And in fact, a year after Matt died, Bishop Steiner hooked us up with a family that's baby was dying. And I was going, what are you doing to me, Bishop? <laughs> I'm not ready for this. But what really was a miraculous was that young lady became Catholic the next year, that young huh. mom. So there was purpose in it. Uh, and then, and then Ron, let me ask you this and maybe, and both Mary, you can ask, uh, answer also for those families um, who might be faced with a very difficult prognosis for their children. You know, what would they and maybe their faith just barely hanging on. I spoke a little bit today about prayer and how so often when our our prayers aren't answered, boy, we hang up that line to God and say, well, you know, I've prayed for this. You didn't answer me. So we're, we're done here. What would you say to those families, you know, t for their faith? How how do they get through these these difficult diagnoses? Wow. Yeah, that's quite a question. Um, I think it is, is, it is faith, you know, because you have to realize, like with Matthew's story, first of all, I didn't even know it was going to happen until God brought him into our lives. And then I didn't know what was going to happen then. And, and the same really every day is we don't really, in many ways in life, we don't understand what God might have planned for us and how it's going to turn out. And so I would just say to to take time in prayer and realize that that you don't know that you're not in control but that god is and and he cares about you and your family and your child very very much and i think also not to isolate yourself with those feelings and to reach out to your priest to reach out to your family to reach out to your yeah. friends so that you're not alone because that's what we did we reached out to bishop we had our pediatrician that was catholic we had really good support Absolutely. And one yeah. final thing, Matthew's devotion to Mary, the oh. mother of God, is so important. And you mentioned about, um, what's his name? We just had his feast day, uh, oh, you know. The Assumption. No, no. No? 
Lawrence was recent. No, 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 that's another story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's always a story. Yes, the saint. Um, he was in prison. Took, so, oh, Maximilian Kolbe. Oh, you know, were right. Okay, Maximilian Kolbe, <laughs> devotion to Mary. You know, he started all those things of the Immaculata and so forth. And uh, his mother said at the beginning of his life, what am I going to do with this child? Or what? what's he going to turn <laughs> out to be? And so he prayed to Mary. And anyway, that started that. And then, because I talked last week on about three people, Matthew and Maximilian Colby and Father Scott Vandehy, because he's the priest that was the most devoted priest to Mary that I knew. And he died on the Feast of the Assumption two years ago. Oh. And uh, so those three, but there's so many people that, uh, you know, through a devotion to Mary, it changes their life. And so, uh, so all these people kind of remind me of Matthew that had that devotion to Jesus and Mary. And even that man that came back to church after countless years, uh, he sent Matthew a little teddy bear, what he sent mm -hmm. to the dying, but he, a card. And he said, without even knowing about Matthew, he said, Jesus and Mary are going to be welcoming you to heaven. And, uh, well, oh. but, but anyway. Oh, so beautiful. Devotion to Mary. Yep. A devotion to Mary. And maybe if Mater you could Dei. talk, yeah, a little bit more. That's right. This is oh. her station. Bishop Steiner, now for those of us who are listening, and I've only come to know Matthew just in these couple of weeks as we've been preparing for mm -hmm. this. Now for all of us who now have just had the opportunity to hear this story, to to know the the prevost and to to know Matthew a little bit, there is something for everybody to take away from this, and maybe just kind of help us understand for all of us who didn't get to meet Matthew but know a little bit about his story. What should we do now with this? What is this? What are we being led to by knowing Matthew in this way? Well. Another thing is, when Matthew died, we were going through in this state the vote on assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. Mary that a lot too, and so the respect for life, the gift of life, the precious gift of life here, and such a tiny child, and yet look what he grew into being—a great saint. And so the idea of life, the gift of life. And then the more important gift of eternal life, uh, gifts of faith, hope, and love, the spiritual gift. So body and soul, and that's Mary, the feast that we just celebrated, the assumption of Mary, body and soul, and uh, her son's body and spirit, and uh, cousin Elizabeth and John the Baptist, they all met together, body and soul of these peace people now who are in heaven, but anyway, just uh, the dignity and sanctity of human life and the thing that we all share together in. And during this uh, coronavirus time, we keep hearing about social distance. Mm -hmm. and we are all separated. Right. But because of our faith, we're also spiritually united and spiritually close to God and to one another. So from social distance and separation and quarantines and all of that, uh, this should be a time when we come back to God, come back to um, the sacraments. Uh, a lot of people aren't able to get to church regularly these days, but hopefully we'll come back with greater force than ever because of little people like Matthew. Oh, I love that. And and Ron and Mary, thank you so much for sharing your story with me today. What is next? I, I, I think that so many people would want to know so much more. Perhaps maybe um, an official publication of writing this down that you might be working on, Mary. I've I've got I started writing my journal entries. And part of the reason I did it is because the after Matthew died, it was my grieving. And I always mm. felt like people were saying, you should be doing okay. You should be doing well. Go on with your life. And I wanted to, I actually wanted to write something where people would see it's all right to grieve, that it's part, mm. it's part of the process. 
Um, but I am typing, I have typed up quite a few of my journal entries about Matt's life. It's just a matter of getting them organized and um, I've given, I've shared them with different people, but it's, it's a goal. Maybe this winter. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be wonderful. And Mary, when that is published, please come back on the show and we'll talk about it again. And we'll tell people how they can get that full story. Ron and Mary, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Bishop, before we finish, will you end us in a prayer? Okay, let us. Uh, oh, by the way, I don't think we mentioned, but uh, Matthew said the rosary. And his mother said, I didn't teach him the rosary. <laughs> Mary, Mary did. did. Mary. And I, it's on tape where he can yeah. say the Hail Mary and the Our Father at six years old. Wow. And, and so, he um, said, yeah, he said Mary taught him that when she came to visit. That was something we had forgotten. During his visits with Mary, she taught him her prayer. Oh. So let us end with the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, Mary full, full of grace, grace the Lord, Lord is Lord with thee. Blessed art thou among Lord. women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. And Matthew, pray for us. Pray for us. Uh, again, that is Ron mm -hmm. and Prevost along with Bishop Kenneth Steiner. If you want to listen to this again or download the audio so that way you can share it with one another, I will be sure to add video of the interview along sure. with the audio and some pictures that you're going to sure. be able to find at materdayradio.com.